You can't put a lithium battery under the bonnet. Heat kills lithium batteries. Don't you know that, you fool? If you do do it, you're dead set wasting your money. This is the ignorance I encountered when I installed an iTech World lithium battery under the bonnet of my cruiser only two short years ago. Well, Jaffa Adventures, it's testing time again. Stick around to find out what happened. Nearly two years ago, I installed a lithium battery under the bonnet of my Land Cruiser. The link for that video is below in the comment section. At the time, there was a lot of ignorance and misinformation around. The keyboard warriors were in full battle dress. You can't put a lithium battery under the bonnet. Heat kills lithium batteries, they said. As is usual with most of these warriors, they had no empirical data to substantiate their claims. It was just hearsay. I've got no time for ignorance, so I set out to get some real-world user information to the scene. In my second video on my lithium battery install, I performed a capacity test to determine if the underbonnet heat and many regeneration cycles had affected it. The results of that test were clear. No negative impact to that battery whatsoever. The link for that video can be found in the comment section below as well. After that video, most of the warriors were silent, but there were still a few of them left on the battlefield like pimples on a butt cheek. Very annoying. Their claim was that the battery had not been in situ long enough to be impacted by any effects from heat. I was thrilled with the results, as I enjoyed massive weight reductions and the awesome storage capacity benefits that lithium offers. It really was a game changer for me. So much so, in fact, that when my lead start battery finally dies, I will be replacing that with a lithium unit. In this third and final video in my lithium series, I'll again perform a capacity test identical to the one that I did in video two. The battery is now coming up to two years old, as I've said, and I've lost count of the number of times that it's been discharged and recharged, literally hundreds. Over 50,000 kilometers have been traveled, including mostly off-road and remote camping. So the battery really has been abused. As I noted, the testing methodology is identical to that that I used in the second video, and the external ambient temperatures are pretty much identical to what I experienced back then, so we can draw some real-world comparisons. Up to this point, I've been completely satisfied with the battery's performance. In fact, it's exceeded my expectations. If there are keyboard warriors left standing after this test, I'm just gonna let these guys wallow in their cloud of ignorance. The empirical data is clear to me and it does not lie. By the way, I'm not sponsored by iTech or anyone else for that matter, nor do I make any money from any of the videos I put together. I've got no motivation other than to share my experiences. All right, let's get stuck into the test. We'll review the methodology briefly and then have a look at some results. There's the lithium set up under the bonnet. Just check out video one if you want to see the install. Had to do a little bit of modification because it's a little bit longer than uh, the original battery. But other than that, very simple install. My test methodology used is exactly the same as in my last video. Got a Travel Buddy oven, which will be the amp drawing source. We're going to use the BVM712 to monitor the voltage drop and also the amperage draw. I've only got one small difference, and that is the fact that I've got a switch panel now, and I got the travel buddy hooked up to that switch panel through a relay, and previously I just had it through a fuse to the battery. So what that actually means, you can see we've got no current draw there at the moment. If I turn on that travel buddy switch, you can see we've got a current draw of 0.21 amps, and that is simply the amount of amps it takes to flick that relay on the travel buddy. So we'll take that into account across the hours of the test and back that out so that we're comparing like for like. But it's a pretty inconsequential draw, really. So we'll turn our travel buddy on to run and we'll watch the current jump. There we go, 8.26 amps. I'll take a reading every single hour until that battery is drawn down to the floor and we'll then compare those results with what we found in the past. The environmental conditions today are pretty much identical to what they were when I did last did this test. I'll leave the door open on the travel buddy so that the thermostat doesn't kick in and out. I want this thing to run constantly and we'll see you back in an hour. All right, there's our one hour timer, and we've got 
at 8.36 amps drawing. So I'll just continue to do this, check it every single hour, and we'll record the results on a spreadsheet, and then we will have a look at those at the end, and we'll summarize what we've got. We're now just on two hours into it, and we're sitting at 86%. Travel Buddy's doing its thing, it's not cycling, it's staying on a constant amperage draw, which is exactly what we're after. Alright, now to the juicy bits. A couple of things we need to understand with this first. We had an average amp draw of 8.5 amps across the test. The BMS in this particular unit cuts out when the battery hits 20%. It's a 120 amp hour battery. Therefore, at 20%, it's got 96 usable amps. And if we take that 96 amps and divide it by our 8.5 amp current draw, we should get approximately 11 and a half hours of runtime. So now that we've got that established, I've got this broken down into three columns. When the battery was new, the seventh month old test, and the 21 month old test, which is this one. Because there's a lot of data here, I'm just going to hide the seven month old test, but you've got it here in front of you, so you can pause the video and you can have a look at it if you like, or go back to video two where I pulled these figures from, and it's all detailed there. But let's have a look at what we're talking about now. So we got 120 amp hour battery, if we're drawing eight and a half amps over an hour's period of time, that should leave us 111.5 amps or 93%. So that's how this test runs. So if we have a look at our actual test, after one hour, it gave me a reading of 93% compared to what was new at 93%. At hour two, it was 86. At hour three, it was 79 v 79. Hour 4, 71 v 72, and so on. Right the way down to the 11th hour. Now, as I said, this BMS cuts out at 20%. My battery actually cut out before that 11th hour. It was about 10 hours and 55 minutes. So I've extrapolated this actual percentage to 19% for that last five minutes of the test. The other thing to note is the variance from new. And what I've simply done there is I've taken the actual amperage versus the amperage that we would have had at new. And obviously negatives like we've got here mean that the remaining capacity is actually lower than it was at new. Let's have a look at a graph because this is where it really shows what I'm talking about. All right, let's have a look at a graph of this. On our y-axis, we've got our capacity of our battery in amps, and our x-axis, we've got time in hours. The new battery is the orange line. Today's test is the gray line. And you can see the current capacity is almost identical to when the battery was new, up until around about the nine and a half, 10 hour mark, where the capacity starts to drop off compared to new. So when the battery was new, it had 26.5 amps left at the 11 hour mark. In our current test, we've got 22.8 amps left at the 11 hour mark. So that is 3.7 amps less than what we had when the battery was new. And that works out to about 3.9%. So basically what this test is telling us is that this battery has deteriorated by about 3.9% over the course of two years of absolute abuse and flogging. Now, my experience with my lead acid batteries is I actually killed them after this period of time. So to have a decrease in capacity of 3.9% over a two year period for me is absolutely fantastic. And that proves to me that these batteries can take underbonnet applications. And you know what? In the end, the manufacturers warrant it for an underbonnet application. So far out, why wouldn't you do it? This is a excellent result. Well, there we have it. The results speak for themselves. Virtually no deterioration in performance after two years of abuse. 
I was replacing my lead acid batteries every couple of years anyway due, due to the abuse that I subjected them to. To say that I am wrapped is an absolute understatement. Is lithium for you? Only you can answer that question. But don't tell me heat kills them because my testing says absolutely the opposite. Keep the shiny side up everybody. We'll see you on the next video. Bye now.